webinar entitled How to Defy a Hereditary Predisposition and Prevent Colon Cancer. Today's talk is presented by the Familial Adnimitous Polyposis Foundation and sponsored by Myriad Genetics and Genentech. My name is Travis Bray. I'm the founder and president of the Familial Adnimitous Polyposis Foundation and will be moderating today's talk. The mission of our foundation is to serve the hereditary colon cancer community by connecting patients, care caregivers, and medical professionals to educational, social, and financial resources while promoting requisite research and healthcare initiatives. Today's talk falls into the latter and is part of our hereditary colon mm -hmm. cancer program, which promotes proactive measures capable of yielding successful prophylactic treatment, thereby reducing the instances of colorectal cancer. Today's talk will be presented by Drs. Randall Burt and Joel Samater of the Huntsman Cancer Institute at the University of Utah. Dr. Burt is the Senior Director of Prevention and Outreach at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, Professor in the Department of Medicine, and holds the Barnes Presidential Endowed Chair. Dr. Samater is an Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine, an Investigator at the Huntsman Cancer Institute, and Director of the High Risk Gastrointestinal Cancers Clinic. A couple of useful pieces of uh, functionality that the Meeting Burner Software Suite holds uh, are highlighted in red here. On the left is a chat box where participants can interact with each other as the talk progresses. And in the top is a Q&A box where, where participants can queue up their questions for the doctors at the end of the talk. Along the bottom is a sliding bar that allows you to provide us live feedback on mm -hmm. what you think about the information that's being presented, whether it's too basic or whether it's very useful to you. And we would definitely appreciate you using this so that we can learn from this talk and continue to educate ourselves on how to present high-level information to, uh, to our participants in our future webinars. If you're at the end of the talk, we will have a Q&A session, but if your questions are not answered, I invite you to email me at travishbray at satfoundation.org, and I will work with uh, Dr. Bert and Samaya to get your questions answered. You can also visit our website at hccpigscuts.org to learn more about our programs, about the resources we're collecting for patients, and about what we're doing for the community. At the end of the talk, which we are recording, we will be uh, posting it on our website as well as the, uh, our YouTube channel. And we invite you to like us and follow us on Twitter and Facebook at FAP Foundation. In a couple of minutes, I will be, we will be getting started with uh, Dr. Bert and Swan's talk and as I queue up the, their, uh, their slides. You'll experience a brief moment of silence, and we'll be back in just a minute. Thank you, Travis, for the opportunity to present today. The title of our talk is Familial Adenomatous Pulposis, Approach mm -hmm. to Diagnosis and Management. And I have here with me Dr. Randall Burke, also from the Huntington Cancer Institute. Glad to be with you also. So looking at this pie chart of causes of colorectal cancer, you can see the vast majority of causes are highlighted in yellow and are called sporadic colorectal cancer, which accounts for about 70% of all colorectal cancers. The blue section of the pie chart is known as common familial colorectal cancer. This accounts for approximately 25 to 30% of cases and exists where uh, there is a family history of colorectal cancer and a close first degree relative. There are rare inherited syndromes that account for up to 5 to 6 percent of all colorectal cancer, and these include the very rare hematomatous polyposis conditions, which are less than 1 percent, samples with the Cowden syndrome, juvenile polyposis, and the acres, Lynch syndrome, which used to be called HNPPC, or hereditary non polyposis cancer, accounts for 2 to 4 percent of all inherited colorectal cancer, and this segment that we will uh, talk about mm -hmm. is familial adenomatous polyposis. 
U2YH associated proteins, which together constitute approximately 1% of all inherited colon cancer. The adenomatous polyp syndrome can be divided into Lynch syndrome, familial adenomatous polyposis syndrome, and U2YH associated polyposis, also known as MAP. These are the two that we will discuss in greater depth today. Features of hereditary cancer syndrome include strength of one's family history of cancer, younger age of diagnosis of cancer in the family, individuals with more than one primary cancer, cancer such as colon and endometrial cancer, which typically exemplifies Lynch syndrome, in the presence of rare cancers such as ureteric cancers, which can highlight uh, cases of Lynch syndrome or cataloblastoma that can be associated with cases of FAP. The inherited cancer syndrome all have different levels of risk associated with colorectal cancer. You can see on this bar chart here, FAP or familial <coughs> adenomatous polyposis is associated with a nearly 100% lifetime risk of colorectal cancer if left untreated, whereas Lynch syndrome has an approximately 75 to 80 percent lifetime risk of colorectal cancer. Quincy acres and juvenile polyposis range between 30 and 40 percent lifetime risk of colorectal cancer. And Cowden syndrome uh, is approximately a 5 to 10 percent lifetime risk of colorectal cancer. Again, today we will concentrate on the polyposis conditions known as FAP and MAP. It might be worth mentioning, too, that even though the cancers that arise from FAP are shown to be less than 1%, most of the people in the country have been identified and therefore don't get cancer with proper management. But the syndrome is common enough that most gastroenterologists will see uh, several patients and families with this condition mm -hmm. to be familiar with it. We'll start with the case description of familial adenomatous polyposis. So a 42-year-old male presents to the office with rectal bleeding. He undergoes colonoscopy, and you can see a picture here of retroflexion in the rectum, which reveals numerous polyps. And throughout the colon, there are greater than 1,000 polyps, most of which are less than a centimeter, but a few of which are between 1.5 and 2 centimeters in size. This is a typical pedigree in FAP and was present in this patient. You can see the index patient has a yellow arrow. He is 42 years old and has over 1,000 polyps. His brother, age 41, had colon cancer at age 35 and also had a desmoid tumor. Going back to the maternal side of the family, you can see his mother passed away from colon cancer along with two aunts and an uncle, all from colon cancer. His child, as well as his nephew are between 10 and 12 years of age and are currently asymptomatic. The epidemiology of familial adenomatous polyposis goes back to the 1800s, with the first reports in the medical literature occurring in 1861 and 1873. Familial inheritance was established in 1934, and the gene was discovered in 19. 82, with APC located on chromosome 5Q21. Prevalence of this disease is between 1 in 6,850 live births to 1 in 31,250 live births. An average prevalence number will be 1 in 10,000 approximately. There's a constant frequency around the world and in males and females. You can see in the bottom of this slide a colectomy sample showing the numerous polyps that occur throughout the colonic lumen. The genetics of FAP are displayed in the graphic to the right. This is an autosomal dominant condition. The APC gene product is a tumor suppressor gene located on chromosome 5Q21. Children have a 50% risk of this disease if their parent is affected. Siblings have a 25% risk of this disease if one sibling is affected. However, a negative family history does not preclude FAP, since up to one-third of cases are due to de novo mutations in the APC gene. On the graphic on the right, you see an affected father in green with one abnormal copy of the APC gene in green, and 
a normal wild type copy in purple. The mother is unaffected with two normal copies of the APC gene in purple. Through Mendelian genetics, each of the children has a 50% chance of receiving a mutant that has the gene from the father, which would give them a molecular and clinical diagnosis of FAP. The APC gene is a very large gene, constituting of 15 exons. 30% of the mutations seen in the APC gene causing FAP are nonsense mutations, meaning they lead to a new, uh, an abnormal nucleotide that truncates the protein. 68% are frame shift mutations. 2 to 15% are large deletions involving one or several exons of the gene. There is a mutation cluster region, meaning an area in the 5' prime end of exon 15 displayed in red in this graphic at the bottom of the screen, where the vast majority of mutations cluster. The adenoma to carcinoma progression is uh, highlighted below and is uh, seen to occur in FAP as it moves from normal mucosa to aberrant crypt focus, early adenoma, late adenoma, and invasive cancer. Mutations occurring in APC, P53, PI3 uh, kinase, and loss of chromosome 18Q. And as best we know, this progression is identical in sporadic colon adenomas and cancer and familial adenomas polyposis. So the cancer risk is not that the progression is any different or has any different time frame, it's that there are so many polyps, with hundreds and thousands of polyps, the risk of colon cancer progression is virtually 100%. There are genotype-phenotype correlations based on the location of the mutation that can correlate with adenoma density. If mutations are, occur on the 5' prime end or the 3' prime end of the gene, as displayed in red here, the adenoma density is lower, often less than 100 polyps in the colon, and is referred to as attenuated familial adenomatous polyposis. Desmoid tumors are often associated with mutations in the mid portion of exon 15, and an ocular finding known as chirpy, congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, also occurs with mutations uh, in a specific area of the APC being highlighted in red here. The adenoma penetrance in this disease is nearly 1%, with a mean age of polyp onset of 15.9 years of age. Cancer risk is also 100% if left untreated because of the too numerous to count polyps in the classic. Mm -hmm. The average age of colorectal cancer onset is 39 years old, and 41% of FAP patients will present with synchronous colorectal cancer. FAP is also associated with a number of extracolonic malignancies. You can see in this table or chart below the various extracolonic cancers that occur under lifetime risk. This includes peripampillary tumors, which constitute a 5% mm -hmm. life, pancreatic cancer, thyroid cancer of approximately 2% lifetime risk, more rarely gastric cancer, brain cancer, a glioblastoma, and hepatoblastoma in pediatric patients between the ages of 0 and 5. Gastric disease, gastric disease and FAP includes gastric polyps, which are 80% of the time benign fundic gland polyps located in the body and the fundus. Gastric adenomas occur in a minority of patients, approximately 10%, and usually occur in the andro. Overall, the gastric cancer risk in FAP is 1%. Here are some photos showing the carpeting of fundic gland polyps that occur in FAP in the stomach and in the body of the stomach, also in the body and fundus of the stomach. Duodenal polyps in FAP usually occur in the second and third part of the duodenum, bearing the bulb. They often cluster around the papilla and are described to occur along the flow of the bile. 
The prevalence of duodenal disease is between 20 and 100%, depending on what case theory is being referenced. Duodenal cancer risk is between 5 and 10% lifetime risk in FAP. Duodenal disease has become a significant cause of mortality in this population, since the colorectal cancer risk can be largely managed with colectin. Here's the picture showing the second part of the duodenum with a large sessile duodenal adenoma. Another example of a villous duodenal adenoma in the second and third parts of the duodenum. As you can see, the sessile nature of these lesions can make them very difficult to remove endoscopically. The staging of duodenal disease has historically been done by what's called Spiegelman stage. This criteria uses a number of categories, including number of polyps, polyp size in millimeters, histology, as well as the presence of dysplasia. You get points for each of these criteria and add them up to define stage zero to stage four disease, with higher stage disease being associated with a much greater risk of cancer. You can see in this photo here the progression of duodenal disease from stage zero through one, two, three, and finally stage four disease. In FEP, duodenal polyps are often intervened on when they reach Spiegelman stage three and four. An earlier stage, stage zero to two, and often stage three can be monitored. Their location is relative to the papilla, and one has to determine whether reception is the best option or ablation with thermal therapies or coagulative therapies such as argon plasma coagulation. You can see here two photos of periampulary disease with a large polypoid lesion surrounding the bile and pancreatic ducts. As stated before, we recommend considering intervention if this polypoid lesion is large, greater than a centimeter, if it has phyllis histology or high-grade dysplasia, or if there are symptoms such as abdominal pain or increased liver function tests to suggest impaired biliary drainage due to the polypoid lesion. Here you can see periampulary disease that is extending from the duodenal wall into the bile duct and pancreatic duct. On the left-hand side is a cholangiogram and a pancreatogram performed at ERCP, which displays soft tissue mass protruding into the common bile duct and pancreatic duct. More commonly now, this is seen with endoscopic ultrasound, which is less invasive than ERCP, but again demonstrates the protrusion of soft tissue polypoid mass into the pancreatic and common bile duct. If the mass is protruding into the duct, it cannot be effectively removed with simple ampullectomy and likely needs surgical therapy and at very least surgical consultation. On-block excision with an ampullectomy or endoscopic therapy should be considered for such periampulary pulps that are less than two centimeters in size, are well circumscribed, confined to the papilla and duodenal hood, with no lateral extension into the duodenal wall, and a negative endoscopic ultrasound supporting no extension of the polypoid lesion into the bile duct or pancreatic duct. Piecemeal resection can be considered for larger polyps over two centimeters if there's lateral extension or a long goatee that extends distally from the uh, ampulla. Here's a picture of such a lesion that would require piecemeal resection. You can see in this ampulectomy video provided courtesy of Chris Gustout from Mayo Clinic a large ampullary polyp that we circumscribed completely with a thin wire filament snare. We ensure that we have the entire polyp and minimize the amount of normal mucosa being tethered. And then using electrocautery and coagulation, we cut through this lesion. Now that the ampullary lesion has been removed, we use a sphincter tome 
to confirm entrance into the common bile duct and on the cholangiogram have wire access to perform a sphincterotomy to ensure adequate drainage of both the bile duct and pancreatic duct while this area is healing and to prevent scar formation. Both common bile duct and pancreatic duct stents are left in for brief periods of time, approximately two weeks to allow drainage while healing occurs without scarring of the distal bile duct and pancreatic duct. Post-therapy surveillance of duodenal antelectomies for the first two years uh, uh, would be be, uh, every two years if it is normal or histology is only tubular, if it is scant residual with just tubular adenoma histology, and less than one year surveillance if it is phyllis histology or there is residual polyp in that area. Complications of ampulectomy and endoscopic management of these polyps include pancreatitis in 8 to 15% of cases, significant bleeding in 8%, perforation in 4%, and stenosis of the bile duct or pancreatic duct in 8% of cases. It might also be helpful to know that FAP patients are now living much longer than they used to because the colon cancer can almost always be prevented or at least detected early. Thus, patients presenting with Spiegelman stage 3 or 4 are increasing in number. And by ages 60, 70, and older, as many as 20 to 30% of patients will fall into Spiegelman stage 3 and 4 and need either endoscopic or surgical intervention. Thank you, Dr. Ferg. Some rare variants of FAP that have been characterized and are historically referenced include Gardner syndrome, which is the presentation of FAP with multiple extraintestinal growths, including osteomas and desmoid tumors. In the picture on the right side, you can see a large extra abdominal desmoid tumor in this patient's back and neck region. Turcotte syndrome described a patient with FAP as well as a medulloblastoma brain tumor. However, this term is no longer used since it was also mistakenly used to describe Lynch syndrome uh, uh, occurring with colon cancer and a glioblastoma brain tumor, and thus was felt to be confusing. Attenuated FAP often presents with less than 100 polyps and an older age of colorectal cancer onset in their 50s and a lower risk of colorectal cancer of approximately 70% lifetime risk. Some other benign extraintestinal features of FAP include congenital hypertrophy of the retinal pigment epithelium, or CHIRPI. These are discrete, dark, pigmented oval patches on the fundus that are often multiple and bilateral eyes are affected. It is a specific sign, but not sensitive to rule out FAP. Dilated fundoscopy or slit lamp examination is required to identify these lesions. There is fortunately no effect on vision when these are found. Osteomas are benign, bony growths often in the skull and mandible of these patients and occur in up to 20% of FAP patients. They do not require surgical management unless they are causing symptoms due to compression or for cosmetic purposes. Again, osteomas occur in 20% of FAP patients. They are often the first extracolonic finding reported, most commonly in the skull and mandible. They are not malignant, but do have cosmetic issues. Dental findings occur in 17% of patients, and the most common is unerupted teeth. Desmoid tumors are benign soft tissue growth that can occur anywhere in the body. They are not malignant, however, they can cause symptoms due to enlarging size and compression of surrounding organs and vessels. They occur in 3.6 to 25% of FAP patients, depending on what case theory is investigated. They can occur in the mesentery and the abdominal wall. The major morbidity associated with desmoid tumors include bowel 
or vessel obstruction and bowel perforation. Treatment options are limited, but include solid DAC and tamoxifen to either stabilize your size or regress, and if that fails, combination chemotherapy. In summary, screening guidelines for FAP to reduce colon cancer risk include colonoscopy starting at the age of 12 with an interval of every one to two years. Once a person has undergone colectomy, surveillance is still required if there is rectal remnant. And this should be done with a flexible sigmoidoscopy every six to 12 months. Duodenal or periantillary disease should be screened with an upper endoscopy with a side viewer examination to best examine the periantillary region. This should start at age 25 and repeat one to three years or occur prior to colectomy. Thyroid cancer is rare, but a thyroid exam is indicated annually. Hatoblastoma occurs in pediatric patients between zero and five years of age. Considerations for screening for hepatoblastoma presented to parents of these children are a hepatic ultrasound and an alpha fetal protein drawn every three months. This is an unfortunate 35-year-old male with familial adenomatous pulposis who underwent a subtotal colectomy and had more than 20 centimeters of rectum and sigmoid colon left intact. He thereafter did not have any surveillance examinations for seven years, presenting with rectal bleeding, and as you can see, numerous polyps, numerous large polyps in the 20 centimeters of rectum and sigmoid, including invasive adenocarcinoma with positive lymph nodes upon final resection. Surgical management of FAP is important. One should consider surgical consultation and surgical management once you have identified more than 25 to 40 polyps throughout the colon, which is often the limit of endoscopic management. Large adenomas greater than a centimeter should also warrant such surgical consultation. Increased dysplasia with villus or high-grade dysplasia should also warrant surgical intervention. This usually occurs between 55, between 15 and 25 years of age for classic FAP patients, often at a much later age for attenuated FAP, and then some attenuated FAP patients, their colon can be retained throughout their lifetime with routine surveillance colonoscopy. Surgical options that are considered in FAP patients include colectomy with an iliorectal anastomosis. This is considered when there are less than 10 rectal adenomas and absolutely requires annual surveillance flexible sigmoidoscopy. The other option is proctocolectomy with ileal pouch anal anastomosis or a J pouch. Chemo prevention options in FAP are limited. However, some evidence supports the use of Solendac for the regression of colon and rectal adenomas. Colorectal cancer prevention with this medication, however, remains unknown. It is not a substitute for colectomy. It is approved for use for rectal chemo prevention in those with an iliorectal anastomosis. Celecoxib was previously also approved for this indication. However, the Food and Drug Administration has now withdrawn its approval, and there is continuing concern for cardiovascular side effects with this medication. Briefly, we will talk about the differential diagnosis in FAP, which includes a recessive condition known as mute YH-associated polyposis, or MAP. It can present with a similar phenotype to attenuated FAP with between 15 and 100 adenomas, older age of onset in their 50s, autosomal recessive, so family history may be limited. There are two common mutations detected in the MYH gene that constitute the majority of disease in the European population. Genetic testing for FAP and attenuated FAP should be considered when you have more than 10 adenomatous polyps or more than five adenomatous polyps and a positive family history of multiple adenomas or colorectal cancer. One should consider starting with NYH testing if recessive pattern of inheritance seems to be more likely. Mm -hmm.
you should also consider referral to your local cancer genetics or family cancer assessment clinic, which is located in most major cancer centers or major cities in the United States. Our family cancer assessment clinic provides personalized cancer risk assessment, genetic testing, cancer screening recommendations, and enrollment into research studies. If you have questions or a patient referral, please call the number shown below, 801-587-9555. What happens when you make a referral to a cancer genetics clinic? You will meet with a certified genetic counselor and a physician with expertise in cancer genetics. Who will obtain a detailed family history, provide personalized cancer risk assessment, and when appropriate, coordinate genetic testing or DNA banking as required. They will also address the implications for at risk relatives, <coughs> provide a personalized cancer screening management plan for yourself as well as your relatives, and long term follow up if required for some patients. They will arrange referrals to appropriate research studies as well as other subspecialists, including gynecologists to assess the risk of endometrial cancer and lymph syndrome, or surgeons for indications of colectomy in these rare cancer syndromes. I also want to briefly mention two different chemo prevention trials that are active or going to be active at Huntington Cancer Institute and may be a benefit to many patients with familial adenomatous polyposis. We currently have active enrollment in a phase two clinical trial of Solindac and Erlotimib, which is an EGFR receptor inhibitor. It is a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial looking at the regression of duodenal and colonic adenomas. The duration of therapy is six months. We will also be launching a phase three clinical trial of SOLMDAC and DFMO in the next few months. Again, this will be randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, looking at the regression of duodenal, colon, and rectal pouch adenomas with a study duration of two years. Both FAP and attenuated FAP patients can uh, be enrolled into these studies, and the studies have travel assistance and some assist financial assistance assistance for standard of care endoscopies that need to be performed during the study. Thank you. And final question. I'd like to emphasize uh, one point that was made by Dr. Smatter, and that is referral to a, a specialty center with experience in these conditions. That is usually important for the genetic testing uh, part of the evaluation when a clinician suspects familial adenomatous polyposis or its attenuated form, then a referral for genetic testing can be very helpful, precisely which genetic tests to order, and even more importantly, the interpretation of the results can sometimes be quite difficult. After that is done, and also based on clinical findings, a set of recommendations can be made about upper gastrointestinal, lower gastrointestinal screening and management, as well as screening for some of the other malignancies that may occur in these syndromes. The patients then almost always will be returned to the referring physician for the appropriate studies uh, based on the recommendations given by uh, the specialty center. We found that patients usually can be managed much better in that way with at least an initial consultation and perhaps later on a reconsultation when surgical decisions need to be made. So often the disease, again, is best managed when, best managed when it's done in coordination between the uh, referring physician and the specialty center. Well, thank you, Dr. Samadar and, and Dr. Burt, for uh, that wonderful presentation. We have a uh, several minutes for a Q&A, but uh, before we get started on that, I wanted to follow up on what Dr. Burt was just saying. If you uh, visit our website at HCC Takes Guts, um, 
you can actually find a really uh, good list of uh, a directory of expert care facilities that Dr. Samadar and I have been comprising um, that may help you find a specialty care uh, center close to you. Um, and I also wanted to say, in case people start having to leave early, that we this video will be, should be on the website tomorrow or by Friday. Um, with that, we have several questions, and I'm going to pass it pass over to uh, Dr. Samadhi to uh, answer a few. Thank you, Travis, and thank you, uh, Travis, and the Foundation for uh, allowing us to present this important topic today for gastroenterologists, coordinators, counselors, and the community. Uh, also, thank you for to Dr. Burt for partic participating in this. So. As we go through the questions, I'll read each of them live and then try and answer them to the best of my ability. So the first question is, isn't the Cowden syndrome lifetime risk quoted similar to the population risk? Well, that's an excellent question. Um, we say the population risk of colorectal cancer over one's entire lifetime is around 5 to 6 percent. And the Cowden syndrome risk of colorectal cancer, which again you have to remember has been taken from smaller studies, often referral-based tertiary cancer studies which have a referral bias, is quoted as being between 5 and 10 percent lifetime risk. <coughs> And therefore, we would say uh, Cowden syndrome has probably an approximately two-fold elevated risk of colorectal cancer over their lifetime compared to the general population. The next question is, um, what is the what is the prevalence of attenuated FAP? Well, we talked about the prevalence of FAP overall, and like the most uh, most commonly classic FAP, is between one in 10,000 approximately to 1 in 20 or 30,000 live births. Uh, it is very difficult to determine the prevalence of attenuated FAP since people, get, and there have been reports of people with APC mutations um, in known families with FAP that have sometimes as low as zero polyps and definitely people with less than 10 polyps, and it would be difficult to discern what the exact prevalence of attenuated FAP is in the population because of that wide phenotypic difference. The next question is, what do we know about Solendac for the prevention of colorectal cancer in attenuated FAP? Again, that's an excellent question. Right now, Solendac is approved by the FDA for the prevention of polyps in FAP patients who have undergone undergone colectomy with an ileorectal anastomosis, meaning it would prevent uh, polyp formation in the rectal remnant. We often do use it in combination with frequent colonoscopy in patients with attenuated FAP. In these patients, Solendac can be useful in regressing or limiting the number of polyps that attenuated FAP patients form, and thereby making it easier to survey and remove polyps at colonoscopy and retain their colon. Next question is, is it now known respect to uh, CNS tumors that cluster with FAP why medulloblastoma seems to dominate versus glioblastoma as is more common with HNPCC or Lynch syndrome? Another great question, and unfortunately it's not known. As I uh, discussed in one of the slides, there are genotype-phenotype correlations between the uh, location of the mutation in the APC gene and certain phenotypic considerations such as desmoid tumors, chirpy, uh, an attenuated presentation. However, these are not exact and no one mutation has been associated with an increased risk of brain tumors in these patients. It is likely a combination of both the mutation and environmental uh, aspects. Uh, next question. Please comment about other cancer risks with mute YH associated mutations. So MYH associated polyposis is associated with primarily only a colonic phenotype and increased risk of colorectal cancer. Uh, there is no known increased risk of upper GI or extra colonic malignancies. Next question. When do insurance companies pay for APC and MYH testing, is there a certain number of polyps needed? This can be very, this can be variable. In general, for Medicare, um, uh, 
payment uh, Medicare reimbursement for these tests. Uh, people who have more than 20 adenomatous polyps in their colon would qualify for APC uh, and reflux testing for MYH likely by Medicare. Many insurance companies also go by this guideline, but not all. Uh, if someone is over age 65 and covered by Medicare, that would be our standard to see if they have at least 20 polyps throughout the colon, in which case Medicare would cover it. If they are not Medicare eligible, uh, we would use that similar guideline to advocate for an insurance company to provide coverage. Any study on naturally occurring agents in FEP like turmeric, et cetera, and chemo prevention strategy? This is another great question. There are some studies, uh, in mostly in laboratory form, that have shown that turmeric may have a chemo preventative effect for polyps and colon cancer. Uh, the area the people who are in, uh, have greatest expertise in this is an investigator and uh, FAP specialist known uh, named Frank Giardello at Johns Hopkins Medical Center, and he's looked at this. Uh, as far as I know, it is not in clinical trial format yet, but may in the future be with turmeric or a related agent. Any date on in vitro? Uh, AVs and the risk of spontaneous mutations causing FAP. Um, no, not that I know of. De novo mutations can occur. De, uh, de novo mutations, which are spontaneous mutations, occur uh, in about 30% of FAP cases. But the chances of it occurring uh, in an in vitro case would be very, very low. Possible, but low. We have uh, the next question is a case. It involves a 31-year-old Hispanic male with childhood astrocytoma who had greater than 10 colonic tubular villus adenomas, including one with high-grade dysplasia. Um, he was negative for APC, Lynch, microarray testing, MYH associated polyposis gene testing is pending. BRCA2 is positive. We'll be undergoing a total colectomy next week. Any further recommendations regarding this particular patient? It's difficult to give clinical recommendations without seeing the patient. Obviously, this patient seems to have a number of different uh, cancers as well as polyps occurring at a very young age. It sounds like he's been tested for multiple genetic causes already. The other ones that probably would come to mind is uh, Lee Fermanis syndrome with a P53 mutation as well, which can rarely present with colon cancer and definitely has an increased risk of brain cancer at an earlier age. My main recommendation for this patient would be to have him or her referred to a cancer genetic center at uh, your children's hospital or adult hospital or adult cancer center to make sure that uh, appropriate testing is done before uh, uh, sur uh, surgery is pursued and uh, to see if relevant testing is needed in siblings or other at-risk relatives. Are there any animal models for inherited colon cancers? Yes, there are. There are animal models, mouse models for both Lynch syndrome as well as an uh, mouse models for FAP uh, called an APC, MIN, M-I-N, mouse. The, they do not uh, uh, recreate human disease perfectly. For example, in the APC min mouse, they usually do not form uh, cancers of the colon and instead often form polyps throughout the small bowel. What do we know? Next question. What do we know about Solindac for the prevention of colorectal cancer in attenuated FAP? I think I answered this question before that Solindac can be used for polyp and colon cancer uh, uh, prevention in attenuated FAP. It is not uh, approved for that use. It's approved use, uh, however, is for prevention or regression of polyps in uh, FAP patients who have undergone colectomy with an ileorectal anastomosis and have a rectal stump remaining. Last question, do patients need, uh, let's see, do patients need to live in Salt Lake City 
to be eligible for the chemo prevention trials? Absolutely not. Uh, both of our clinical chemo prevention trials we talked about have travel assistance available and we're able to bring patients in from uh, throughout the United States um, uh, to participate in these clinical trials and both travel assistance and the cost of endoscopy can be largely covered uh, with these clinical trials. I think uh, that's the end of our question. Thank you so much for allowing myself and Dr. Burke to participate in this wonderful program. I hope everyone was able to benefit from it. And I'll hand it back to Travis at this point. Again, thank the, I thank the doctors for uh, presenting. I thank you for attending. And I thank Myriad Genetics and, and Genentech for supporting us, uh, helping us, help, helping to uh, support this, uh, this webinar. If you have any further questions, if you want to follow up, if there's anything else we can do, uh, send me an email at Travis H. Bray at fapfoundation.org. Take a tour of the website, pass it on to your patients, and um, we uh, look forward to hearing from you in the future. Thank you. Well, so for the for people that are still on, there's one more question um, people are bailing, but uh, we'll pass this over and get one last question in. So the final question is, I, I, I believe that the New England Journal of Medicine reported a study which showed that Solomduck had little to no efficacy in terms of primary chemo prevention in patients with FAP, current ongoing trials showing more promising initial results. So another excellent question. There has been debate in the different studies that have been performed about the effect of Solomduck in preventing fall in FAP patients. Uh, different studies have shown differing uh, levels of effect. Um, in general, in the community, it's believed that Solendac does have some effect in regressing or reducing the number of polyps, and is FDA approved for this indication? Uh, we have seen in many of our patients, anecdotally, that polyps do regress uh, with the use of Solendac. Uh, final question about dose of Solendac. The general starting dose of Solendac is Solendac 150 milligrams PO twice daily. We often will try that for three months, um, Rescope the patient to see if it has any effect, and if it has, we will try and lower the dose down to 150 milligrams PO once daily. Obviously, we try and do that to minimize side effects. Remember, Sondac is an NSAID type drug and does have a risk of gastrointestinal ulceration, peptic ulcer disease, bleeding. One can also consider adding a proton pump inhibitor in parallel to reduce some of these risks associated with long term Sondac therapy. And we're going to stop it there for today. Please email me at Travis H. Bay, SAPFoundation.org if you have any more questions. Thank you. And be, looking, be on the lookout for a uh, survey coming your way. Uh, thank you very much. Goodbye.